guys, Break Hard Podcast back again for another week here. Uh, last week I said that it took a restart controversy to bring uh, the podcast back. This week it took Hendrick Motorsports' 40th anniversary and another dull, boring short track to bring us back once again. Probably keep doing this weekly. I saw some of the comments last week. People were like, oh, you need a co-host. Uh, you know, listening to you talk for half an hour isn't the best. I agree with you. I'm 100% on board. I'm in the process of trying to figure out a co-host situation, maybe like a rotating cast, somebody different each week, maybe somebody the same each week. Kind of depends on what everybody's schedule is. I do have the freedom of not having to go into an office, which makes life very convenient for me. And I know not everybody has that luxury. So we'll work around that. But for now, Lord Byron went back to victory lane for the third time in eight races to start the season. And for you keeping math at home right now, 36 isn't divisible by eight, but 32 is and that's four times. So right now he's on pace to win 12 times with still four races to go if he continues at his current trajectory, which is a historical number in the sense that 12 is the closest somebody will ever have gotten to that Jeff Gordon, Richard Petty, Magic number of 13 wins in one season. Jeff Gordon went on to win 33 races across three seasons, something we'll never see happen again. But William Byron has the chance right now to have a historic season in terms of number of wins. Will he get that done? Probably not, right? As the season goes on, the dominance from the beginning of the season kind of tapers, and then it's a momentum-based sport. Is he going to carry that same momentum through the next eight races? Uh, I would doubt it. However, we're heading to some tracks that he's historically pretty decent at. So maybe, maybe he can do it. Remains to be seen. But for now, three race wins in the first eight races. Denny Hamlin has two race wins in the first eight races. Hendrick Motorsports has four of the first eight. So they're currently on pace to win 18 races this season. Of course, the record in the modern era, I believe, is 19 with Joe Gibbs Racing. So yeah, Willie B is certainly having himself a season to start off. Goes on the Netflix show, talks about his love of Legos, doesn't win the championship, maybe makes some changes in his personal life, and all of a sudden, dude's a rocket ship out there. He looks like Jimmy Johnson in his prime right now. He just can't lose, in a sense. And I think the, the scary part for everybody else in the series right now has to be the fact that he has three wins on three very different racetracks. He's a short track win at Martinsville. He has a super speedway win at the Daytona 500. And he has a road course win at Coda. Did I mention this past weekend was Hendrick Motorsports 40th anniversary? We'll get back to that in a minute. Not sure if we have. We had to mention it a number of times. I have to meet the quota uh, as it comes through. So for William, though, this is a great start to the season. And typically in the Rudy Fugel era of William Byron's career in the Cup Series, they start off strong. 2022, they started off strong two wins early in the season and then didn't win the rest of the season. Last year, they picked up six wins and they spread those out through the year. Pretty good. This year, they've already picked up three wins in the first eight races. We knew William Byron was going to be good when he came to the Cup Series, it was just going to take some time. They probably moved him up a year earlier than they than they should have. But at the end of the day, the guy has looked really, really good. It's like, oh yeah, this is the William Byron that went to win eight races in his maiden season in the Truck Series, his rookie year. Won four races in his Xfinity Series uh, rookie season. All the guy does right now is win. And now we're finally seeing that on the Cup side as well. The ratings for the Cup Series race came out on Tuesday morning as well, and I'm trying to pull them up right here. 2.19 million viewers for Sunday's NASCAR Cup Series race at Martinsville, flat from last year's 2.218, so down just a little bit uh, last year. It did go head-to-head with the Women's Final Four Championship game, which got 18.7 million viewers, also on network. NASCAR was not on network. NASCAR was never going to get close to 18 million viewers for a race at Martinsville. Not really that comparable, but maybe that was what accounted for the slight drop. Who knows? Moving on, though. Hendrick Motorsports. It was our 40th anniversary. Fox, somebody in my comments on YouTube said that he sat and tallied it, which is potentially unhealthy behavior. But if he is correct, they mentioned Hendrick Motorsports or Hendrick 40th anniversary 203 times on the broadcast. I don't believe that's true. I also don't have the time to go through and listen to the broadcast or the care to see if that's how many times they said it. They said it a lot, though. They did a couple different feature interviews from the Hendrick Motorsports hospitality area outside of turn two, where they had 1,500 employees. 
it was cool. I will say this. Hendrick Motorsports, everybody's going to come through here and be like, oh, the it was course. Of course, they were going to win. It was rigged. I had my tinfoil hat on the other night. I don't have my tinfoil hat up in the office anymore. It has moved back down to the garbage can in the kitchen where it more than likely belongs. But everybody thinks it's rigged. Hendrick Motorsports wins the race, the 40th anniversary of their first win in 1984 with Jeff Bodine, also at Martinsville. Of course, that's why they put so much emphasis on this race. They not only win the race, but they lead home a 1-2-3 finish. William Byron, Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott round out your top three. The company as a whole, Hendrick Motorsports, led 238 of the 400 laps on Sunday. Everybody's out here going, it's rigged. It's the WWE. This is NASCAR's answer to wrestling. It's scripted. Listen, I've seen the script. Everybody gets, everybody in the know gets a copy of the script beforehand. It wasn't scripted. At the end of the day, this was supposed to be the five cars victory for Kyle Larson. That's what the script says. It just didn't play out that way. The 24 didn't want to play. So eventually later in the season, when the 24 is scripted to win, the five car will likely end up winning there. So if you're watching a race and you're seeing the 24 car dominating, just keep that in mind that the script says that the five car or the 24 is supposed to win, five cars is going to steal one back because they have to even it out because that's the only way that you keep parity around, right? So everyone says it's scripted, uh, but it's not. How do you script a 400 lap race, right? And how do you... The, Hendrick Motorsports is historically good at Martinsville. This was their 29th victory. It's like, of course, if they had never won at Martinsville and they lead home a one, two, three, you'd be like, okay, well, maybe. I mean, that makes a little bit of sense here. But it's not scripted, right? This isn't the 2001 Summer Daytona race. I actually don't think that was scripted either. I think things just work out because DEI had the best plate package at that time. Of course, one of their cars was going to win. It just happens like that. It wasn't scripted. It wasn't scripted. They're just really, really good. They put a lot of emphasis. All four of those drivers really wanted to deliver a win to the team on the day where the entire company was there. So, yeah, it was not scripted. Yes, they talked about it way too much. I will agree there. We talked about it was a Hendrick Motorsports broadcast for three and a half hours or whatever this race time ended up being two out three hours, two hours and 52 minutes. It's a quick one. Uh, it's 400 laps. So that makes sense. But yeah, at the end of the day, that was a Hendrick Motorsports love fest and which is fine. They are the most successful team in the sport. But after a while. I mean, how many more people did Michael Waltrip need to go talk to over there? Um, still cool to see. Of course, they get another chapter in the storybook for them. They started off their 40th anniversary season uh, earlier in the year with a win at the Daytona 500. Now they win on the 40th anniversary of their first win at Martinsville. So, yeah, they didn't win a championship that year. So you can't say that, oh, of course, they're going to win a title. But right now, through the first eight races, of course, William Byron does look like the car to beat. However... We did just come from a Phoenix race where the Toyotas looked absolutely untouchable a few weeks ago, and the Hendrick cars did not look very good. Now, granted, they bounced back at Richmond with this new short track package, and then, of course, they showed out on Sunday at Martinsville. Denny Hamlin tried to get up there and ruin the fun, though, and I, there was a lot of people that point to the fact that it was scripted because Denny pitted late in the race on that green-white checker after the 42 car blows uh, the right front, slams the wall. They throw a caution, which it did need a caution for like we, we talk about every week. Oh, that shouldn't have been a caution. This shouldn't have been a caution. Yeah, it should have been a caution. He pounded the wall. Same way that the caution should have come out last week at Richmond when Kyle Larson um, got spun off of the nose of Bubba Walls. That, that has to be a caution. You have a car sliding across the racetrack into the infield. Yes, you have to throw a caution there, regardless of what people are like. Oh, well, he got going again. Yeah, but it's a crash. You have to throw a caution for that. A Haley Deegan going up and not touching the wall just because she got loose, you throw a caution, that should not be a caution. Guys tapping the wall probably shouldn't be a caution more often than not. Um, guys spinning on the entrance to pit road at Atlanta should be a caution. So I know it's a judgment call, but it was the right call at the end of this week. And then they proceeded to put basically Virginia Beach in the 42's pit box and the amount of speedy dry that they put down that was excessive i've never seen so much speedy dry in one place did all of the oil in the car drain out did they just pull the plug and they're like oh fuck oh i'm not supposed to... sorry for cussing to pull a line for sketch there uh but yeah it's it was a lot of speedy dry and i've never seen that much speedy dry in one spot it, you don't need a lot just take a scoop throw it out it starts to absorb and these guys just literally they were ripping tops off of bags and then just dumping 
40 pound bags right out on the ground it's like what are we doing here that's way too much speedy dry so that took forever to clean that up i mean the race went 415 laps and the caution came out what was that final caution yeah the final caution was 15 laps caution comes out on lap 399 and they ran 15 caution laps to lap 414. This race supposed to be over at lap 400. Again, I'm in the camp of respect the race distance. Race should have ended at lap 400. We don't need green-white checkers. But the green-white checker finishes coming up. Denny Hamlin is told by his crew chief, Chris Gabehart, do the opposite of the Hendrick cars. If they stay out, you come in. If they come in, you stay out. Smart. Because obviously tires weren't wearing and tires didn't really account for that much. We saw him with Joey Logano. He was able to run 180 laps on left side tires and still finished fifth in the stage after not pitting. That's unacceptable. That's absolutely unacceptable. That He ran almost half of the race on the same set of tires and still was really competitive. Didn't win the stage, faded a little bit, still managed to get top five out of that stage. Unacceptable. So... Tires clearly weren't worth that much. Denny Hamlin pits, comes back out 10th. He was really the only one that pitted out of the front. Nobody else came with him. And then he manages to lose a spot on that green-white checker and comes home 11th. Should have finished in the top four, probably. Probably should have, not probably, definitely should have stayed out and just tried to see if he could bang his way to the front right there. Bubba Wallace, meanwhile, comes home fourth. He had a really stout car all day. I mean, he was basically uh, like fourth to six, kind of all day. Uh, didn't lead any laps, just looked looked competitive actually scored more points than the winner William Byron did he scored 51 second most points of the day behind Kyle Larson's 53 so yeah they were really stout Ryan Blaney comes home fifth last fall's winner Joey Logano sixth Tyler Reddick seventh Alex Bowman eighth in the other Hendrick car the fourth Hendrick car Ryan Priest ninth and Chase Briscoe tenth so Stuart House Racing does have a little bit of speed uh, which should make their charters enticing to somebody else to be like hey they're gonna finish pretty good on the points so you're gonna get a better payday because uh it sounds like they're going to downsize to two cars more on that later the race though what a boring, mundane race. We need. I posted a video yesterday about going to short track therapy where I laid on this couch right here and I went to therapy. And the only solution is more horsepower or a narrower tire. I said this in the video. NASCAR used to, well, not even used to, but in the last few years has used the all-star race to experiment with different packages that they wanted to try. That's how we got the high downforce, low horsepower package to try to turn every mile and a half intermediate race into a super speedway race. And then that's essentially what we got with the NA18D package, which is like in 2019 when we went out there and used the high downforce in 2020 and 2021. And you couldn't pass, right? At mile and a half, everybody just foot to the floor, turn left, go fast, and then just you basically end up there. Everybody's slot cars. That's what it was. So they, they tested that package out at the All-Star Race. They've also tested a number of other things out there as well. So now we're going to a short track for the All-Star Race, right, at North Wilkesboro. And last year's race was a snoozer. Kyle Larson dominated the day and probably would have lapped the field if they let him. Everybody looks past the fact that it was a bad race because they were just happy to be back at North Wilkesboro, right? Oh, look at something shiny over here. Ignore what's happening over here. That's essentially what happened. So why don't they use this year's All-Star Race as an opportunity to take a big swing at it? And by big swing, I don't mean like you don't have to make huge changes to the car. You could have everybody run a thousand horsepower because having teams create engines for the one-off and not have to do it every single week is probably easier to do than having to like retrofit or build new engines uh, for the whole season. So maybe, maybe you could do that. Or, or you could try something different like the treaded tire use the wet weather tire it doesn't even have to rain don't rain actually i would love for it to not rain use the treaded tire and see just how good the racing is if it's bad it's bad if it's good it's good who cares it's the all-star race i know some people paid i think upwards of 150 dollars to watch the all-star race i would not recommend paying 150 dollars to watch the all-star race i would recommend you saving your money for the week later and go to the indianapolis 500 where you can go and get really good seats for 150 dollars i believe my tickets this year were like 80 mid 80s i don't actually remember now but either way i don't sit in the penthouse i i sit in just a normal stand but no they were more than that doesn't matter yeah they were definitely more than that it was like 109 dollars 
doesn't matter. Why am I why am I sitting here pondering what's going on with the price of the tickets? Who cares? I would save your money though. If you're going to go to the, don't go to the All-Star race, go to the Indianapolis 500. It's a better show, better experience. Uh, you get to kind of go wherever you want other than into the garage area and it's a festival. It's one of the best racing days of the year. That's me out here promoting the Indy 500 because it needs it. Actually, it doesn't. 325,000 people are going. Kyle Larson will be there as well. If you're going to the All-Star Race, so, or NASCAR going to the All-Star Race, rather, run the wet weather tire, right? Less contact patch. That's essentially what it comes down to. If you have this treaded tire on it, it's not a slick. So you're going to have less traction, less contact. Like I said, it should produce better racing. Obviously, the racing that we saw at the start of the Richmond race, when the track was drying out and they were running the wet weather tire, was really good for the first 30 laps. And then the next 370 laps stunk. So maybe you try it out. And yeah, the tires are going to wear out really fast. They just will. That's what happens with wet weather tires when you race them. I mean, we see it happen in Formula One. We see it happen in any car all the time. So if you have to pit two or three times in the All-Star Race, good. Make it happen. And don't throw cautions for the length of the tire wear. Let this play out, right? If you know that the tires wear out after 60 laps. Let's just throw that out there. I have no idea what it will actually do. Don't throw a caution at lap 60. Let it go. Let it go. Let them make the decision when they want to come in and pit. Everybody raved about how much we love the Bristol race, right? Because there was tire strategy. There was different. I know some people were like, oh, that Bristol race stunk. Nah, it was good. Have that happen at the All-Star race. Let's see what it can do. And then if that's good, you know that you can produce a groove tire. Think of Formula One before they went back to slicks where they had the groove tires back in like the late 2000s. And basically that's where it stopped at actually. Into the late 2000s. Have that on the car. Because of a less contact patch means that you're going to have better racing. Means that you're not super gripped up all the time. That's good. Make these teams have to work for it a little bit more. Obviously they are working very hard. But I'm saying like make make the cars harder to drive. We need tire management. We need these cars to be able to spin the tires. Blow the tires off of these cars. That's what it needs. <sighs> they got to fix something. Because they can't keep doing this. This new short track package is just bad. We take little steps. Like I said, there's 300 steps in front of us. We've moved up three steps. And there's still 297 to go. We need to start jumping flights. I got long legs. I can do eight stairs at a time. Easy. Maybe. I don't actually know about that. Oh, I don't want to put my foot on the camera there. That's bad. I'm not wearing socks today. I'm not trying to give a free show out here. I was going to stretch and see how long I could go. I'm 6'5". I got a lot of leg. Do the math here. It's it's a long shot. I don't want to put my I don't want to put the microphone down between my legs because that's going to look bad. It's visually bad. We don't want that. Is your leg span the length of your arm span? Cuz the length of my arm is about 6'6". Six, six. Got long I got long fingers. So, if your legs go that far and your standard staircase, oh, my legs are way longer than my my arms. This is a whole different discussion that I was not prepared for this morning. I don't have a tape measure in my office. I don't think. Nope. I got hats. I got a stapler. Not a red stapler. Um, monitors. Nothing. Okay. Well, never mind. If anybody cares, um, let me know in the comments and I'll let you know how long the leg span is to go upstairs. I'll test it out on the stairs when I get done with this. Who cares? Shut up. Um, yeah, so that was the that was the NASCAR race. <laughs> Martinsville, this got off the rails very quickly. All right, let's see where we're at currently. Oh, man, we got about... Does that say... Oh, okay, good. All right, 10 minutes to wrap all of this up here. We have to talk about the Xfinity race. The... Uh, why? Why? All right, moving down. The Dude Wipes 250 with the legend Frank the Tank from Barstool out there. New Jersey Transit is incompetent. Uh, he gave the command to start the race. Also rode in the pace car. Couldn't be bothered to be riding the pace car, though. Had to complete a grid on his phone instead of seeing the race. But Eric Almarola finally gets his first win for Joe Gibbs Racing in the Xfinity Series. Well, first win after that other first win that has an asterisk next to it because at Milwaukee, 2007, everybody knows the story at this point, he was leading the race, driving the uh, Rockwell automation car, 
Rockwell Automation wanted Denny Hamlin in that car. Denny Hamlin was off in the Cup Series, wasn't racing at Milwaukee that weekend, has to fly in, gets there mid-race. They pull Eric Almirola out of the car while he was winning the race, put Denny Hamlin in the car. Denny Hamlin goes on to win the race, but because Eric Almirola started that race, he's credited with that win. However, I don't think he has a trophy. I don't even think he stayed for the victory lane celebration. In fact, I know he didn't. He His career at JGR then kind of dissolves he goes off to do other things he ran the eight car at dei for a minute sharing that with mark martin and one of the more odd pairings that you could ever have and then of course did a season at jrm did a season in the truck series with billy Ballou, i believe and then he went over and did <coughs> and then he joined Richard Petty in the 43 and then joined Stuart Haas Racing, which is where he's been. And now he's in the Xfinity Series. He wins uh, at Martinsville. He gets us as on the sponsorship for the car. Uh, good for him. Uh, he's over there to be a mentor to the younger drivers. And by mentor, I mean beat the crap out of them <laughs> and absolutely run through them. Because everything that all the veteran drivers complain about doing, Eric Carmel did all of that on Saturday. So he wins the race. The Cuban Missile, as he was once known, I don't know if that was a self-appointed name or not, but he leads 148 of the 251 laps, easily the best car all night. We're late in the race on a late race restart. He decides to take the top. And Chandler Smith is like, okay, dude, like if you're going to part the seas like Moses here, like I'm going to take the bottom. Like it's clearly the better lane here. And duh, like he should have absolutely done that. So then... The 81 of Chandler Smith kind of uses up the 20 car, and then the 20 car just goes down into turn three and four and just bumps him, boots him out of the way. Classic bump and run. Chandler comes home third. Sam Mayer comes home second. Sam Mayer probably had a really good shot of winning this race. Probably should have won this race. He was able to get around Almirola on a restart. He gets the lead. And then Sheldon Creed on another restart, because that's just what happens at the end of Xfinity races. Sheldon Creed got desperate, like he does, and tried to... <laughs> bull rush his way to the lead didn't work out shockingly enough Sheldon Creed once again doesn't win and ends up finishing six so Sam Mayer got used up right there comes home second Carson Quapple on debut finishes p4 in that number 88 car for JRM a week after Bubba Pollard finishes p6 on his Xfinity debut I posted a video on Sunday about all the good things Dale Jr. is doing for grassroots racing right now between owning the cars tour and giving these guys a bigger platform as well as putting these blue collar hardworking grassroots racers into his uh, Xfinity cars to give them an opportunity to prove themselves he's doing everything and in fact his cars tour Brendan Queen Butterbean is going to be making his NASCAR debut at the truck series race at North Wilkesboro in May for the Tricon Garage the number one truck so his platform of the Cars Tour of promoting these guys is helping them get rides in NASCAR. And that's exactly what this sport needs. It needs more of this raw talent from the grassroots short track level to move up. So hopefully uh, Butterbean has a good showing as well. The same way that Bubba Pollard and Carson Quapple had good showings here uh, too. Josh Williams gets a top 10 for Colleg, finishing 10th. And Shane Van Gisbergen, uh, everyone's favorite Kiwi, finishes 11th. Guy's figuring it out on the fly here, and that's fun. He did get out, and he was like, oh, some of the guys are pretty rude tonight out there, but he loves it. He loves it, which I love that part of it. He loves the aspect of NASCAR racing and being able to beat and bang. So I'm excited to see what else he can do this year. Obviously got robbed of a second-place finish at Coda um, when the Xfinity Series goes to another road course again uh, here soon. I fully expect him to be the guy to beat out there, right? He's just... He and A.J. Allmendinger are just so much better than every other single car on track. And if it wasn't for that stupid late race caution and restart at Coda, he wins that race going away. So, yeah, uh, good for him. Good for him to start figuring uh, it out. And then, oh, you also have the nine car, Brandon Jones, missing a shift, which then caused everybody to stack up, uh, which... Shout out to uh, Cam Waters introducing a new a new uh, term word into the NASCAR lexicon, which I'm sure some people had to go look up after the truck series race on Friday night when he said, yeah, everything just kind of Constantinered because that's how he says it in uh, Australian speak, uh, which is essentially accordion. And that's how his, his night ended up ending. That's what happened here. Brandon Jones misses shifts or the car pops out of gear. 
I uh, couldn't really tell. Causes a big wreck. Catches up the 21 car of Austin Hill, um, AJ Allmendinger, Corey Heim, and a couple others. So that was bad. Don't ever like to see that, but it's part of racing. They're off to the to Texas this weekend as well on Saturday with the Cup Series. Truck Series race on Friday night. The Long John Silvers 200. Who is keeping Long John Silvers in business? If you have eight out of Long John Silvers in the last decade, let me know in the comments. Because I couldn't even tell you where those Long John Silvers at. There used to be one that I can think of in the city that I live in. And it is now a barber shop. So that's an odd use. It was raining. I had to go with the dog in. Did test out the stair theory, though, for people that are still listening. I can do six stairs. I have an old house, old stairs. Uh, it has a landing, you know, up, landing, up. Again, uh, long stretch. Okay. Make sure my feet weren't on the TV. TV. Screen. Long John Silver's 200. Christian Eckes picks up his second win of the year. Ty Majeski finishes uh, second. Those two guys led... <laughs> 199 of the 200 laps. The other lap went to Nick Sanchez. Yeah, it was a it was a truck series race. You had guys running into everybody. I think Lane Riggs spun out multiple times. Not think. He did spin out multiple times. The Daniel Dye crash cam got some good use this weekend. You have a bunch of guys out there. Um, Caden Honeycutt, I believe, hit everything on track at some point or another. Not the best, not the worst showing, not the best, not the worst that we've seen in the um, truck series. Chase Purdy, P3, did not expect that at all. Shout out to him. Um, definitely is a pay guy to be in that truck, but he's doing really well. Like, that's a really good ride. <laughs> P3 on merit at Martinsville. Good for him. And then we had Cam Waters making his NASCAR debut. Doing it at Martinsville in the truck series, which is certainly a choice. I mean, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it. Baptism by fire style. Apparently, we'll also be seeing him at Kansas in a few weeks as well. So that should be pretty good um, in the truck series, that is. He said he loved it. He got out afterwards. Uh, he got written in the back of them and really uh, unfortunate. Blows the radiator out of the car. It's just spewing water everywhere. He comes in talking to the media afterwards. He's like, yeah, I loved every second of it. We can't beat and bang down Australian supercars, which were races at. Um and he's like, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And basically the same thing that we've heard SVG say as well. Same with Brody Kostecki. So, yeah, maybe the uh, Australian invasion is going to happen, right? Marcus Ambrose died so these guys could live. He didn't die, actually. He just paved the way. And unfortunately, never got the opportunity in really top-grade equipment. Because if he did, I firmly believe that he would have won multiple races uh, in, in on ovals, rather. He has a multiple race winner, but on ovals, he would have definitely have been really, really good, especially with this new car as well. So, yeah, unfortunate that his timing just didn't work out for him or he never really got in with that bigger team. But SVG getting in with Trackhouse and then you have Cam Waters getting in with Ford, Brody Kostecki getting in with RCR like they're getting in with competitive teams, teams that have won races, uh, you know, within the last year and, and this season at Trackhouse as well. So, yeah. Pretty exciting for them. So we have all three series. Oh, sorry. The Aust the Formula One Japanese Grand Prix also happened this past weekend. Max Verstappen won again. Pretty surprising there. Did not expect that one. Sergio Perez finished second. Again, two fastest cars finishing one, two. Wild, wild concept there. My favorite thing that Sky is doing right now is when they get super excited when Sergio Perez passes slower cars because, like, yeah, the guy in the fastest car on the grid should be passing slower cars. Uh, it was an okay race. It was procedural in the sense that, like, there wasn't a ton of on-track passing. Not that there ever is. You had good strategy, though. You had a bunch of different people on different tire strategies, which is always enticing and exciting. Unfortunately, it was on in the middle of the night. So unless you woke up like I did to watch it, you probably didn't watch it. Uh, you didn't miss anything either. First lap incident between Alex Albon and Daniel Ricardo, which was Ricardo's fault, brings out a red flag get back to racing after that and then it was pretty straightforward uh but like i said there was good strategy at least so you have that going on a great five-way battle in the pits but yeah it still a lot of things that are wrong with this car the current generation of formula one cars it's they're too big they're too bulky you can't 
at an old school circuit like Suzuka, they're just, they're too big. It just is what it is and what it comes down to. And that circuit's not good for racing with these cars. So hopefully the 2026 regulations, which will condense the cars a bit, not back to what they were, but, you know, condense them down a little bit, will certainly help things out. So we'll have to wait and see there. But they're off this upcoming week. They return in China a fortnight from now. That's two weeks. This weekend coming up, we have the all three NASCAR series in action. Trucks on Friday night, Xfinity Saturday afternoon, Cup Sunday afternoon as well. And then you also have the MotoGP race at Circuit of the Americas where Garage 56 will do some demo laps on Saturday with Jordan Taylor behind the wheel, which is pretty cool. IndyCar is off until, well, two weeks from now. And they'll return for the Grand Prix of Long Beach uh, along with IMSA because apparently this IndyCar taking six weeks off between the first points race and second points race of the year was just a real big brain move from 16th and Georgetown. So that's unfortunate. But yes, that's where we're at this weekend. Be back next week to talk about Texas. Who thought that we'd ever be excited to go to Texas? But after the last two weeks, I think we're all excited to go to Texas. So like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.